When I saw her letter, I just thought, you can't, you know, it was just, you, you, you can't mean this. My jaw dropped, I thought, how could you possibly think any of this stuff? But then she did put out a statement that said she repudiated everything that she'd said. I got it wrong. I'm sorry. People said she doesn't mean it, you know, this is not a real apology. And I looked and I thought, but, you know, what, what, you know, th this is classic actually on social media that when people apologise, the people's instinct for anything, people's instinctive reaction is they're not really saying sorry. Mm. But then, <laughs> you know, how do you say sorry if that wasn't yeah. sorry? Do you know what I mean? Robert Preston, hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How are you today? Uh, a bit frazzled. It's uh, the morning after my show, which is, as you know, it's late at night. So mm -hmm. it's. Um, Sort of, thir sort of Wednesday to Thursday, there's never a lot of sleep. <laughs> no, no, I can't imagine. I imagine you get very little sleep anyway, as, as part I of mean, the I mean, I try to get a bit of sleep. I, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're right, you can't do what I've done for, 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 for as many years as I've done it and care deeply about sleep. But no, no. Um, well, our audience will obviously know you in your role as political editor of ITV News, of the host of Peston, mm. but you're also here in a different hat today because I'd like to talk to you about um, your charity, Speakers for Schools. Thank Could you, you tell us a bit about that? So, uh, I set it up in 2009, so a long time ago, and I set it up uh, when I was at the BBC, as you say, now at ITV, because I kept getting invitations to go and speak in schools, but the invitations weren't from the kind of school I went to. I went to a comprehensive in North London. Uh, I've campaigned for comprehensives in state education all my life. Um, but all the invitations came from posh fee-paying schools like Eton and Winchester and Westminster. And I just took the view, you know, those boys, kids, had more than enough advantages anyway. Why, you know, wh why would I want to be doing them a favour? But equally, I was a bit frustrated that the kind of school I went to wasn't getting in touch. So I did a bit of research, try and find out what was going on. Um, and what I discovered was, you know, the teachers in state schools didn't have the confidence or the networks or the time to invite people like me to go in. And actually there were also some sort of really, I, I thought sort of shocking cases of state schools feeling they had to pay somebody like me to go and speak which I thought was outrageous because mm -hmm. they would get in touch with the agent of somebody and the, the agent would charge them money. And I thought, this is just ridiculous and wrong. So one of the things about being a journalist for as long as I've been is you get to know, I mean, in my case, thousands of people. And I, you know, rang up people who I thought would make inspirational speakers in state schools. Um, and pretty much everybody I rang up said they were also frustrated that they didn't get invitations to do this. I said, would you give talks for nothing if I sort of set up an organisation that matches you with schools. They pretty much everybody said yes. Um, and uh, we started therefore with this very simple, really quite small charity, which was all about getting, as I say, inspirational people to go and talk in state schools. Then a few years ago, I also became a bit fed up with the way that work experience always seemed to go to you know, the kids of middle-class parents who had connections. So we then moved into arranging work experience, uh, particularly for underprivileged young people, mm. uh, all in state schools again. Uh, so now we are, I mean, providing, well, hundreds of thousands of both, uh, of opportunities to state school students, either to hear from inspirational speakers or to go into amazing institutions like the Bank of England, like Virgin Atlantic, to get really high quality work experience. Um, uh, so we've grown from this, you know, basically initially it was me and one uh, at that point, sort of, you know, fairly recent young graduate woman and we sort of set it up together and now we're about 150 people. Uh, as I say, we reach hundreds of thousands of young people every year. Um, I mean, truthfully, of all the things I've done in my career, it's the thing I'm most proud of. And, and right now we've got this campaign. We're trying to persuade the government uh, to make it a basic right of every school student to get at least two opportunities to go into some kind of business or some kind of institution to learn about the world of work for a few days from the age of, well, we think you should get at least two opportunities from the age of 14 to 18 to find out what opportunities are out there. I mean, in my case, 
uh, you know, I did loads of work experience and loads of jobs when I was young, and I learned at least as much about what I didn't want to do. <laughs> you know, so I, you know, for, for example, you know, one of my early jobs was being locked in a freezer room and told to stack these boxes and sweep it out. I sort of took the view, actually, maybe it was worth passing some exams because I definitely <laughs> didn't want to do that with my life. And then I went into a magazine, actually, it was the, the Economist, uh, when I was a bit older, and uh, spent an afternoon with the books editor. And he basically poured whiskey down my throat, and I thought, well, actually, this is a bit more That's fun. fun. <laughs> That's fun. I'm not, not so, sure. so, as I say, it's at least as much, you know, and in the end, I did end up in journalism, uh, not as a huge drinker, but nonetheless, you know, <laughs> just discovering that journalism was about ideas, it was about understanding about the world you know, gave me, a, you know, the ambition that that's what I wanted to end up doing. And how do you feel about uh, school children having the right to have whiskey poured down their throats by... Well, obviously, I would not <laughs> encourage, I would not encourage <laughs> any young people to drink whiskey until they're well into their 30s. <laughs> well, that's, that, I'm four years off that, so I look forward to, the, to that. To <laughs> that your first day. class. Oh, I'll, toast, I'll toast you when I... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting speaking about work experience, because obviously in our industry, in media and the news more widely, yeah. work, I think... People talk about it's who you know that gets you into um, into these places. It's connections plays out an unfortunately large part in even getting your foot in the door to most to most jobs. Um, there's been some like staggering statistics about yeah. the NCTG reports that 80 percent of journalists come from professional and upper class backgrounds. Well, why do you think that is? You, you didn't come from a so I came from a middle class background, um, uh, but I am of a generation and I started in newspapers, um, where there were lots and lots of working class people working in newspapers. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, and actually this is a story about how all sorts of Brit parts of the British economy have changed uh, since the 1980s, which is when I started. In the 1980s, in journalism, there were basically I hate the word classes, streams, cadres of people working in newspapers. There were those who basically joined when they were 16 as apprentices and uh, learned on the job. They would often join local newspapers and then they would make their way up to nationals. Or there were a smallish number, um, like me, who went to university and then went uh, in to newspapers. So my first national newspaper was The Independent, which I joined just before it was launched in 1986. Over the, those years since then, newspapers, the media, has become professionalised. It was a essentially a trade, um, and you got people from all walks of life going in. It increasingly became a graduate uh, occupation. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, the more that it became a graduate occupation, the more it became a middle class occupation. Um, but there's no reason why that should be the case. And um, one of the things that, I mean, some media organisations are, again, looking at apprenticeships rather than just pure graduate routes. And I think that's probably a good thing. But you are absolutely right that although it is a way more diverse uh, industry in terms of ethnicity, uh, than when I joined. So if I think back to my first big newsroom, it was largely white. Mm -hmm. And it was, I don't know, 70 or 80 percent male. Now, if I look at the newsroom at ITV or I look at the team that makes my program, um, first of all, it's filled with young people. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, you know, certainly within the people who make my programme, I'm the, program, the oldest by, I actually know, also it's true that the programme, the series editor, a brilliant woman called Vicky Flynn, she's also roughly my generation, but apart from us, everybody else, it's terrifyingly young, <laughs> unbelievably brilliant. I mean, they are so on it, brainy. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, now we have... Uh, you know, there was a period, it's not true anymore, when people of colour were the majority on the show. Um, now I think it's roughly 50-50. Uh, there are more women than men uh, working on the show. Um, all of which I think is brilliant. But you are right, I'm not 100% certain that we have as many working class people mm -hmm. as we should. Um, and I think there is an issue throughout uh, the media, but actually just throughout all sorts of influential, you know, 
jobs industries that you know I think there is an issue about people it's one of the things that you know one of the things that speakers of schools is all about is raising the ambition trying to help create opportunities for people from disadvantaged backgrounds and although you know ethnicity is still associated with disadvantage um, there are a lot of white working class particularly boys uh, who've given up on ambition given up on hope and there is an issue about whether or not we as a society are doing enough to encourage them into these jobs now mm -hmm. and also I think if you're not from not from London, really, there's very little, or you can't don't you can't afford to move to London. There's very little roots as a young person into the media with the death of the local press, things like that. You have so to one of the things, so as you say, one of the things that is t is really frightening to me is, um, you know, as you say, there was this 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 very well established route. You joined a local paper, or you joined a trade paper, and then you you know you proved that you were up to it, and then you got taken on by a national. Um, and as you say, the complete hollowing out of uh, local papers uh, is a problem in terms of learning on the job. I mean, what I do say to all people who want to go into the media is technological change has created enormous opportunities, but you know, whether it's you know, writing on Substack, doing your own blogs, doing your own films and all the rest of it, but you know, there is quite a lot of financial risk sort of starting out as essentially a small business on your own. Um, and one of the reasons why I fear, you know, it slightly discriminates against people from less advantaged backgrounds is you've got to have, you know, in some cases, I suppose, a wealthy mum and dad who are prepared to support you as you sort of learn on the job without a steady income from an employer. Mm. So, of course, that also discriminates against people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And there's another thing going on. This, I think, is one of the uh, massively under-debated issues challenging uh, all of us now. But, you know, there was a time, again, where you could learn on the job by doing bog-standard, you know, little reports on what was going on in an industry or what was going on in, in a community. So much of that can now be automatically generated by an artificial intelligence mm. programme that, you know, that there's no longer these very basic jobs for people to learn with. You know, in a sense, you know, the whole industry is now about, you know, people creating a name for themselves with their investigations or their columns or their, you know, their personality-driven pieces. Um, and again, I slightly fear that that uh, gravitation towards, you know, the sort of influencer community, again, tends to benefit people who've already got an income. Mm -hmm. And a following as well. It's very hard to start out yeah. in that role when you don't have really two subscribers or two followers. Yeah, it's, it's very it, challenging. Yeah, extremely. Um, what is, is there anything or any case you're particularly proud of with uh, Speakers for Schools? Um, or, or an outstanding case? Well, I mean, you know, we, I come across young people all the time who say how much they've, you know, they've been motivated by a particular talk or, um, you know, by a particular example of work experience. But as I say, we are reaching hundreds of thousands of people uh, every year, young people. Um, I'm just, you know, frankly, just proud of the fact that we're doing what we're doing. Um, I think we're perceived to be the market leader in essentially this aspect of raising ambition, trying to encourage social mobility. And so of all the various things I've done in my life, um, you know, essentially setting up speakers for schools is the single thing I care about most and proudest of. It's, 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 ama it's really amazing work. But then the, the other thing that you're known for in your life is being a political journalist, yeah, yeah. particularly at the moment. And so you're in the parliamentary lobby. Mm. And I, I think there's always a discussion, a constant discussion of the lobby. It's, is it fit for purpose? Does the system, does the system work, this anonymous briefing system with quotes that can't be attributed to sources? What, what do you make of the system? Do you think it's a, a healthy system? So it's, it's much, much healthier than it, so I was, so I've done different, I've done, you know, business journalism, economics journalism, investigations, but I have had two chunks of my life when I was a political editor. So I was a political editor in the 90s for the FT, political editor now for ITV. And it is way healthier than it was in the 90s. 
to get back to the diversity issue in the 90s, it was pretty much all men. I mean, there were one or two absolutely outstanding women political editors like Eleanor Goodman of Channel 4, but, you know, they were very much a minority. Now, you know, I guess that in the lobby it is 50-50 men and women, which is great. Um, the, uh, and it is, the, the whole, uh, it, it is more, much more transparent than it was. You know, uh, when I first joined, uh, it was like joining the Freemasons. I mean, you had the sort of <laughs> basic, you know, the, the, the so-called lobby briefings, uh, where twice a day you were briefed by the Prime Minister's spokesperson, and in those days um, there was a sort of weird room at the top of Parliament where it took place in, uh, uh, as well as taking place in Downing Street. And um, I mean, and to go to my Freemasons point, actually I wrote about this in, I recently, Combative recently published a thriller called The Whistleblower, which has a big chunk about what it was like mm. to be uh, working in the lobby in the, in, in the 90s. And the room we used was actually the room that was reserved for Parliament's Freemasons, <laughs> believe it or <laughs> believe it or don't, you couldn't make it up. Um, anyway, we, 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 we used it um, for lobby briefings. Uh, but you actually, when you joined the lobby, you sort of signed a sort of blood oath that you weren't even, not only were you not allowed to source the information that you were given in these meetings. You, you were actually initially, to, you know, you were, you were not allowed to admit that these meetings took place. Even you know, you were supposed to. If anybody asked you, you just had to deny that these 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 um, that we were being briefed in that way. Now, as we moved through the nineties, it all became a bit more transparent. And today's lobby briefings. Um, you know, uh, we're allowed to record them. Uh, we do uh, attribute what is said to the Prime Minister's official spokesperson. The question, but this is not just a question for the UK. Uh, it's actually a question for these arrangements in lots of countries. But, you know, we are in the UK. <laughs> the question is whether it is healthy to have particular cadre of journalists, in this case political journalists, um, in a sense sitting in one confined physical space, which we are at the, you know, the top of a building in the Palace of Westminster, and whether that creates a groupthink um, that means that perhaps there's not enough competition that would be more challenging, uh, A, to the government or the opposition, or to the way that we... Um, think about big political issues, mm. um, whether it creates a little bit too much of a uniformity of view. Now, I would definitely have said that in the 90s, um, there was way too much of a herd instinct. Uh, I think there is now uh, much more competition uh, in imagination. Journalists do do different things within the lobby. There is not this, um, you know, slightly... You know, in the old days, I'd say there was a slightly sort of sinister um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm thinking for? There were, you know, the, the journalists in the old days did um, cooperate too much mm. in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of secretive way. Um, so I think there was something wrong with the old system. I think, as I say, I think it is, it is better than it was. The issues now, I think, are less around the political lobby and more around the way that individual prime ministers have attempted to influence newspapers. And so, you know, it is well known that when Boris Johnson was prime minister, he would regularly, uh, you know, ring up editors mm -hmm. and encourage them to do things, occasionally shout at them. Uh, you know, uh, they're, they're, I was told one absolutely hilarious story the other day uh, about, you know, how there'd been a meeting in Downing Street about a story on the front page of a newspaper, um, which uh, the communications secretary you know, said in the meeting, well, this is obviously wrong. We're going to have to correct it. And uh, the Prime Minister piped up and said, oh, I'm awfully sorry, I gave them that story. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, you know, this is sort of interesting territory, mm -hmm. uh, uh, shall we say. Yeah, definitely. And what I think, what I found interesting, I'm a journalist, I was not in the lobby, mm -hmm. about paying close attention to Westminster, is, is, 
I sometimes think, is the lobby, are individual members of the lobby too close to the government? In terms of, you have journalists who were godparents to the Prime Minister's ch children, which I think, is, is, how, does that, how do those interpersonal relationships affect reporting? Um, so one of the things that is sort of striking about this country is how connected all sorts of people are in all sorts of different worlds. I mean, my own view is that, uh, you know, we all, sometimes we're aware of our prejudices, sometimes we're aware of our biases. I think the important thing, whether we're talking about uh, journalism uh, or about any other kind of important job where you're sort of influencing opinion is, you know, whatever interests one has need to be out there. People need to know your connections, as it were. I think if people are aware of connections, then they can make their own judgments about whether or not what you're saying is impartial or fair or not. What would be sinister is if, and it does happen sometimes, there are close relationships which are sort of hidden. Um, but I get back to my original point that so long as, as there are genuinely lots of different people competing with different points of views and different backgrounds, then you have a healthy media. If, it, if uh, one felt that everybody was unhealthily close to this or that politician, um, you know, then that's really bad for democracy. And we're sort of, you know, too close to a sort of, you know, and I don't think we are there, but then we are too close. Um, to a, the kind of system that we associate with, you know, autocracies. Mm -hmm. And as I say, we're not there. Um, but so, and, and we're not there because I think we do have a system which, when there is a conflict of interest, mostly it's exposed. So that's, it's good to hear. <laughs> a healthy, uh, still a healthy democracy for the moment. Um, I'd like to come lastly to, over the weekend, Diana Abbott, uh, wrote to The Observer in a now infamous um, bit of news where she compared the racism that uh, Gypsy Roman Traveller, Jewish people and Irish people received. She compared it to, black pe uh, to the racism black people experience and said it's not the same. You said that after she apologised, she made a very public apology and you said that, that the apology should be accepted in the spirit of kindness and understanding. Why do you think that's important? Oh, gosh, this, this is a very uh, difficult issue. I was um, staggered by the letter that she mm -hmm. wrote to the Observer uh, because she basically said that, in some senses, the racism experienced uh, by black people was significantly worse than anything experienced by, you know, travellers... Irish people, Jews, I'm a Jew, uh, 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 you know, members of my extended family died in the Holocaust, my, all my family came from, you know, the Pale of Settlement um, uh, in the 19th century, early 20th century, which was essentially a racist Russian setup, uh, constraining what Jews could do and where they could live. Um, you know, anybody who's listened to the testimony of Holocaust survivors, uh, and he's read the astonishing books about what the Germans, Nazis did, you know, knows uh, what extreme racism <laughs> means. And that was experienced by Jews and indeed travellers, gypsies. Um, you know, I, I know lots of Irish people whose family you know, experienced appalling racism in this country in the 1950s and 60s. I mean, you know, in part of the world where, you know, I grew up and live in North London, there were lots of, you know, signs on, uh, you know, bed and breakfasts and, you know, places where, you know, places for rent which said no Irish, right? Um, you know, so this was real racism. Mm -hmm. And when I saw her letter, I just thought, you can't, you know, it was just, you, you, you can't mean this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, ha you know, I mean, I just looked at the letter and I just literally my jaw dropped. I thought, how could you possibly think any of this stuff? Um, you know, basically sort of somehow say that, you know, uh, white people can't have experienced genuine hate racism. Um, 
And so I was shocked. My first tweet was all about how extraordinary this was mm. and, you know, did she not understand about the experiences of, you know, families like mine, as it were. Um, but then she did put out a statement that said she repudiated everything that she'd said. Um, now, I don't know how she managed to think that this was an appropriate letter, but her statement simply said, I repudiate it, right? I got it wrong. I'm sorry. Um, and yet there was then, in a sense, I mean, you know, there was then this sort of massive pile on onto her where people said she doesn't mean it, you know, this is not a real apology. And I looked and I thought, but, you know, what, 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 you know th this is classic actually on social media that when people apologise, the people's instinct for anything, people's instinctive reaction is they're not really saying sorry. Mm. But then, <laughs> you know, how do you say sorry if that wasn't yeah. sorry? Do you know what I mean? Now, my other point about her is, you know, I've obviously uh, been a political journalist for quite a long time. She has experienced, as a black woman, uh, astonishing amounts of hate, racism, right, as an individual. And I think, you know, I think her own personal experience in politics has been very challenging. So all I was saying in my tweet, which a lot of people then criticised me for, was let's show, you know, it, it, there's too much hate in this world. There's too much intolerance. If somebody says sorry, let's try and accept the, the apology in a spirit of, you know, tolerance and kindness. There's just not enough kindness in the world. Now, you know, on my show last night, I was talking to Jess Phillips, who sort of agreed with my general sentiment uh, about we need to show kindness, particularly to people who themselves have suffered from racism, which she has. Um, she also said, uh, and I understand this, that the Labour Party, particularly given the experience that they had with anti-Semitism under Jeremy Corbyn, had no option but to remove the party whip from her, to throw her out of the parliamentary party. And I guess that's right. But I still hope that, you know, with, with whatever, ex, you know, investigation the Labour Party now does, you know, it's conducted not uh, in a way that is designed to humiliate, but is in a way to, to, to try and understand how she could have made what is a shocking mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think so long as she is prepared to accept that she made a shocking mistake uh, and to sort of speak publicly about how she got it wrong and to show compassion for communities like mine, as it were, then I think we should, you know, I just, as I say, my fundamental view, and I've felt this now for about 15 years, there's been this, this, this steady erosion of kindness and tolerance in this country. And, you know, it's, it's undermining um, social cohesion, happiness, our ability to fix the problems in this country. And we've got to find a way, even when we see people making these egregious mistakes, of allowing them to find their path, you know, mm -hmm. back to, you know, sanity, tolerance, and the rest of it. Otherwise, what's the point in apologising? Thank you for your time, Robert. Pleasure.